Talking to Alan Holdsworth, a.k.a. Johnny Crescendo, well-known disability activist, uh, founder of Dan, and uh, musician, in fact, the voice of the disability and protest movement in the 80s and 90s in the UK. So, very nice to be talking to you. So, uh, you tell us about how you got your impairment, how you related to it as a youngster, when you began to change your thinking about it. My impairment in 1953, when I was about nine months old, caught it in Booth Hall Hospital. And I got into it for an operation on my left palate. In those days, there wasn't lawyers with, with no win, no fee, otherwise, I think my mum would have sued them. But it was a 50 50 chance, and it was either a house or you know, to take a roll of the dice. They didn't take the roll of the dice, thank God. Uh, we bought the house in Presswich, which is just up from Salford. And my early childhood was idyllic. I remember still, and it's still there, Presswich Clough, which is, oh, it's just like a little place out of Lord of the Rings. It's just never been touched. It just, now and again, he just chopped the trees back, or he's got a whole fern field. Had hundreds and hundreds of Blackberry and Raspberry buses, which we just raided. And on the other side of it was Presswich Mental Home, which was the largest mental hospital in Europe. Now it's a Tesco, thank God. <laughs> and uh, But it, in the old days, it was our cricket pitch, it was our football pitch, it was our tennis court, it was a place where you could go and pick daffodils for your mother in the spring and be chased off by the one warden who was, you know, patrolling like 50 acres of ground. So that was our other play, play, play area and on the other side of the house was a cornfield where we'd, you know, hide in the corn shucks and, you know, build haystacks and all sorts of stuff. So we were the terrors, terrors of the neighbourhood. Uh, it wasn't until I got to secondary school that I really kind of became aware that I was that different. And that, that difference is going to make a difference, if you know what I mean. I started getting bullied and teased. Uh, I think that's where all my drive for inclusive education comes from, from that particularly bad experience at Stand Grammar School in Whitefield. If, uh, if you're not sure about that, there's a, a Facebook site which says Stand Grammar Alas No More, but when you actually go on the site, it's just a tale after tale of people being bullied and hit and beaten by the, by the teachers. I mean, my, my English teacher was a drunk. He would sit in the front of his class with his bottle of sherry and a cigarette and teach his uh, English. But he was a very good teacher. I actually quite liked him. I don't know uh, that main thing. But eventually, by the, by the third year of that, by the time I'm 14, I'm not going to school. I'm sawing uh, my leg brace with a hacksaw. But I invest in a hacksaw so I can break my caliper, which means that I can have another week off school because uh, they've got to wait till it gets fixed. My mother's going, how are you breaking all these carpets? And she never knew that I was doing that. I would then chew it from school. We had a truancy officer around. And I spent most of my time when I wasn't breaking my carpet, but was off school, in Manchester Library. So I wasn't averse to studying. I was just averse to the regime of school. So I actually did a lot of, you know, and the librarians there would pass me books and I would do all my research and whatever I was trying to do. And eventually I did come out with, you know, a reasonable education, but, not, but by, by no means as a, as a result of the schooling. I then was very much in the sort of passing phase from then on in. From the age of like maybe 17 to 24, the, the priority was to find a girlfriend, but I wasn't good enough. I didn't think I was good mm -hmm. enough. Uh, and it was until I was really about 24 that I had my first proper relationship. Mm -hmm. Although I had one at 17, then that was it till 24. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, and he would just accept me for who I was. By that time, I'd been doing, I was an assistant scoutmaster at 16. I then ran a youth club in Salford, which is a very poor area, in a very poor area, a very poor town, uh, from the age of 18 to about 26. Was that then, paid work? Or? That was volunteer work. Volunteer. It was with a church. My, granddad, mm. my grandfather died when he was 21, mm. so I actually sort of took over his place in the church, but also then my dad's best man was at that church, and he... He uh, said, why don't you come and help me open the youth club? So we opened this youth club, we ended up building a community centre, got millions of pounds in grants for a big community centre in the neighbourhood. Uh, and all this was voluntary. I also worked in Fort Ardwick in Beswick, and Beswick in, in Manchester, just outside Manchester Centre. That was one of the roughest estates in Manchester. The kids burnt the youth club down there. Uh, then we had to do detached work, which was like no club, nothing, but we'll still do some uh, work with the young people. So I was really into... Poverty issues very much. That was, that was really a thing, and I saw how education could be, you know, just, you know, I could see how poverty was passed down the generation from one to the other, and it was like, it's so sad to see a kid of four who you knew was going to be in the same boat when they were 44, and how to sort of break that cycle. I then was persuaded to go and do my youth work um, um, degree. 
So I went to Manchester Poly, did the university degree, got the job, came out, you got off. So the one place I don't want to work is London, of course, that's where the first job came up, because mm. uh, I'm from Manchester, so I, mean, I don't want to go down London, but then it was a very high, a well paid job, it was a scale three teacher job straight out of college in, in South London, in Croydon. Uh, still nothing to do with disability. Mm. This was a much more about race now. Mm. We're, we're talking around the time of the Brixton riots mm -hmm. and stuff like that, and it's just up the road where uh, we were just down the road, sorry, from, from that. Uh, and we were affected. We had a murder. A white kid was murdered in 1981 called Terry May. Uh, National Front was been in the, the area. Uh, so we had a lot of tension that we had to um, dispel. And make it in turn and create. We set up a thing called an anti boredom scheme, not a great, not the greatest name, but basically it was a sun, summer scheme where instead of closing the youth club down and hiding behind the doors, waiting for the rights to whatever, we opened it up. So we had a video project, we had a musicians collective, we had cricket on the. On, on the we, we, had, we bought cricket equipment and let kids use it on the, on the playing fields. You know, we had all sorts of things going on. And in the end, Princess Di came the next year and you know, you know, blessed it, which means it's still going today. <laughs> but not, not under that name. So, I mean, uh, so that was the thing there. I thought opening up the facilities to the kids mm. would be a way of dispelling some of the tension. Still, yeah, not into disability. We moved to Telford. In Telford, I was working with a black Rastafarian project. It was, it was about that, that, this was like the Thatch of Britain now. You're into mm -hmm. the um, unemployment being really high, you know, and uh, people opening things like drop-ins. And I, I just hated that idea that here's a drop-in where you just come and play pool and have a cup of coffee and that's it. So we get, that was what it, that's what I inherited. But we ended up doing a, a black cooperative. Some of the kids were into sound systems, took them on a tour of Ireland. Yeah, I took them to Brixton to play at the, uh, to played in, uh, not Brixton, not Hill. Took them around there, they, they did a little tour. Some of the other kids were into fashion design, so we, we had a fashion sh uh, shop upstairs. And then the, the coffee bar, which was there, we turned that into a Rastafarian coffee bar, a vegetarian coffee bar. So it became like a whole way of black people being able to mm -hmm. get business. Young black people, disaffected black people. Mm -hmm. I always had trouble with the Gavinger, but that was black as the thing, I'm sorry. But, you know, we had that kind of... Everybody, everybody from my chain of command up had an understanding that no one was going to come down on me for Gavinger, even mm -hmm. the cops. So it was like, because if you do that, then you get into real messy trouble and it's just not worth the, the hassle. Then I got a, the next job was a promotion to team leader in Chesterfield. So now I've got, like, full-time workers under me. So I'm thinking, this is going to be really good, you know, I can really... But there was a woman there called Izzy, and Izzy was... Um, one of these women, some people would call them the right tongue women, but she's a wonderful, wonderfully astute, politically astute, and great organiser. And she had a t shirt which or said, Never assume. So I, I, I had assumed that I was like the boss, but that clearly wasn't the case after a couple of weeks. We were going to work as a cooperative. And they'd appointed me over a black person because they had an integrated youth club. And my job was to get rid of. Uh, transition, excuse me, the older people had learned difficulties out of the youth club to, because they were, they were like, in the, the youngest was 19, the oldest was 26, and the rest of the non-disabled kids, who might be also deaf and blind, it was upstairs by the way, there was no mm. it was deaf blind kids and people there, but the younger, they were all like 14, so there was a big gap mm. between 14 and 19, and we felt it was time to think, how are these people going to move on? They're going to have to move on soon. Mm. So that was my job. So we started by taking them to the Labour Club, meet Tony Ben, to come to the Chinese restaurant. Then we, um, so we made all those kind of silly mistakes that we did. And what, was, what it was, was I didn't want to do it because I couldn't see the issue. I couldn't see mm. the issue. I could mm. see race issues. I could see, les we had the lesbian and gay teenage group. I could see that issue. We could see the sexism issues. But I couldn't see my own issues. Mm. So, but working with this group, that's how I actually got to see my issues. Because I wasn't working. I, I approached it all wrong. I just I approached it in a way that said, um, you know, I'm just, you know, it's jelly. You know. So in the end, what we did was just about forming an independent living groups. So they met at my house, and we did cookery, and then we sort of talked about things, and we sort of, they wanted a birthday party, they wanted jelly and ice cream, so it's not appropriate. But if you want beer and a barbecue, we'll do it. Otherwise, just do it yourself. So they had a beer and a barbecue, so we got into age appropriate stuff, and we talked to the mothers and fathers, and their worst nightmare is what's going to happen when. What's going to happen to Johnny when I die? So then, that then became the issue of independent living and housing and all that. So we then we formed a housing cooperative. Da, 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 da. It then became really you know good stuff. This is what I was doing all my life. You know? mm. I was doing issue-based youth work, and that's really that, that little group of seven 
kids taught me all I know. I mean, I still hanker back to that. I still relate back to those stories that were there. In, 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 every time I come across disabilities in whatever, I think, what we were doing in the independent living group and how did... Because it usually happened there, because we were meeting three times a week, you know. And sometimes at weekends with residentials and getting them lost on the train and everything. Oh, my God. So, yeah, it was... Um, yeah, that was that's where it started. Then uh, I was starting to play songs. I thought, well, I always wrote songs about my experience. I wrote some stuff around racism, mm. wrote some stuff around poverty, and I started to write now about disability. First thing I wrote was where to get that leg. This is about people mm. asking me about how my leg. Mm. And then I wrote choices and rights. <laughs> and I wrote I love my body, and I, I, I poem about anti charity, about the Manchester Taxi Drivers Association who used to take kids down to Blackpool for half an hour every year with balloons and bells and whistles blazing. So that was called the Taxi Driver's Treat. And I started to perform in sort of more in a more radical way in the youth in, in folk clubs. And I was doing like a bit of punk poetry like John Cooper Clark. He was a good friend of mine, so I kinda of got inspired mm -hmm. a bit by him. But that's where like where to get a leg was a typical mm -hmm. kind of Clarky sound of thing that he'd do. Um, and um, I was my girlfriend was coming up from London uh, for the weekend and I got a phone call on the Saturday morning and he said, uh, we, someone's pulled out of a gig, it's not a gig, we know you're very near and there's only way you could come over and do it. Well, the, the going rate for a gig those days was about 10 quid and they were offering me 40. So I called my girlfriend and I said, look, let yourself in, you know, the key's under the lamp pot, you know, I'll, I'll be back, I should be back by nine. You know, they want me there at seven, I, can't, I can get back from Nottingham to the Harvey, you know, in that time. Oh, no problem, let's go over there. There's a guy on, he's singing a couple of songs, uh, and then it's me straight on. I did choice and the rights, where to get that leg, taxi driver's tree, I love my body and the blues. And say, thanks very much, for I've got to call my girlfriend, come on, right, see you later. That was a BCO VPA GM. Mm -hmm. The guy that went on before me was Ian Stanton. And then the phone started ringing, and then the TV started, and the TV started ringing too, right? Because it was like the birth of disability art, and there was a guy who was doing it out of the blue, you know, and he'd already wrote choices and rights without meeting anybody in the social model world at all, mm. you know? So, because all that came from the independent living group, really. Um, and from that, people like Ken Davis got to him. I can't believe this, this guy lives right in Derbyshire, like, and, you know, I don't know him. So mm. I got invited, not by Ken, but I just, to the coalition because they hadn't got a lot of they were trying to outreach to people who learned the foot to make it a true uh, you know uh, broadening broadening the coalition of, of disabled people so I went there and that's how I got to meet Ken and one of the early things that happened was the the there was a supposed to be supposed to have a rep on the town planning committee in Chesterfield mm -hmm. but we hadn't notified the planning committee that our rep had died six months ago and so, consequently, a whole order had gone through uh, on pedestrianising Chesterfield Town Centre without any thought to anybody bad shot, orange bad spaces. So we were going to be basically shut out of the town centre. You couldn't, you know, you couldn't park anywhere near it because all was there. So how do you get to the post office to fill, you know, get your cheque and all that, blah, blah, blah. And they were just like, so, no, you had your chance. To, you know, and it was our fault. You know, mm -hmm. the bad guy which had someone on there strong. But, you know, it's hard to represent yourself mm -hmm. everywhere anyway. Mm -hmm. In the end, we had to do a picket. And I wrote another song for that called uh, uh, Access. And uh, by that time I was on a program called One in Four. So like every time I did anything that time, they, they, you just, they said, yeah, we're doing a campaign. You're doing a campaign. Just, oh, right, we're going to film it. We're going to film it. So we, we, they, they were there to film. We had Tony Ben came, Dennis Skinner came, Harry Barnes came, all spoke at the rally. And we had a picket line across the town square so people couldn't mm. they could go around the, around all the way around and come in but they said that's what we're going to be doing if you don't get this sorted yeah so they did one this is in like december november did another one in december this is cold right and that still didn't do it so but on the second one we all decided that some of us would park our cars illegally get a ticket and refuse to pay and i i was living in london by now so i was coming back to chesterfield mm. I uh, began to meet Barbara and start to live down there. But I was coming back to Chester for these demos. And uh, I didn't get a ticket. I mean, Ken got one and his, another guy, Jack, got one. Uh, and I didn't. And I, I was just as illegal as I was next door to them. And mm. I don't know why I didn't get a ticket, but I didn't get a ticket. But anyway, so we had two people that didn't get a ticket. So they then went to the court. You know, went to the, we refused to pay. Went into the court. Court carried them up steps to get into the court. Uh, and he just, Ken just said, well, you know, it's £80 now, right? I refuse to pay it. With respect, put me in jail. 
or you know deal with it you know case suspended <laughs> suspended again uh, that didn't mean it was over it was going to be another one and somebody paid it we, we believe it was the leader of the council here <laughs> says, says Bill Flanagan uh, actually was the guy who was going to and he paid just to get rid of it. You know, and then they commissioned a very quick um, quick study from Leeds University, and suddenly the, the blue badge, the orange badge spaces appeared on the plan. So they found a way of just kind of doing it without losing face. So how had you got to London? How had I got to London? Uh, well, because I started to play around, perform mm. a lot, I, I, I'm performing all over the, 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 the country now, because this was like my, my baptism into the movement. Once I was doing choices and rights and stuff like that was every single AGM, you know, <laughs> inclusion people there, they would say, oh, AGM, who's there? We've got this new guy, Johnny Crescendo, let's go and... So I would be meeting people like Richard mm. Rice and Richard at gigs and at, meet at the heads and the, of every single coalition around the country because they were the ones who were booking me. So I had a very, very fast-track education. And, of course, I'm, I'm now I, we, I did a gig in Milton Keynes where with Heart and Soul uh, and Barber. And Barbara died. She died. She, she did an awful comedy set. It was one of those nights mm. she felt sorry for her. Because nothing happened. And I went down with a bomb. A mm. fall down, so, which is hard to do. Mm. And I went down really well. So it's champagne. Chef Armstrong would put it on. He, he sent tw a case of 12 bottles of champagne afterwards. Sean was there, Osbeth, Morrison. And we all, you know, me and Barbara was smoking like a chimney at the time. So I, I had cigarettes. We ran out of champagne, but I had a wine box. So... Me and Barbara got pretty plastered in Milton Keynes. That's how we met. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, she said, might you come down and, you know, uh, some London sometimes. And there was a lot of, lot of gigs at the, at the uh, Workhouse Cabaret. I was on there every, every month almost. Mm -hmm. So I was doing that. And she said, might you just move? You can move into us with us if you want. So I moved in with Barbara. That's how it kind of, that's how it kind of began. And that was fine. Yeah, it was mm -hmm. like, I, was, I was ready because Chesterfield, it was, there was a reorganisation again. It's always, I always lost my job through a reorganisation. And it was like this non-disabled worker who thought he was a bee's knees and disability, had no idea the social model was not happy with me doing my job, which was almost like a social worker. Mm. He said, well, I, I'm not, I'm just following what the kids' issues are. If it, it involves me working with social services and housing, that's what I would do mm. if it was. I worked with criminal justice when it was with mm. poor and black people. Yeah, I'd work mm. with the drugs unit. Yeah, mm. so I'm not I'm not a drugs officer, and I'm not, you know, so I, he couldn't see the difference. He couldn't see that this was the issue. I think he wanted me to get back on the bus to Blackpool. So I, I was ready to go. I was very ready to go. So uh, I then became an equality trainer and singer, and started, uh, I met all the people like yourself, mm -hmm. Richard Reiser and Michelin mm -hmm. and Christine Wilson, mm -hmm. Barbara, Ken Davis was still my mentor, met Mike Oliver, so I was really getting Vic Finkelstein asked me to do I Love My Body for the Open University, to get to, get to know Vic. So I started to get to know some of the real, and, and of course Jane, mm -hmm. of course Jane Campbell. Um, to, you know, uh, and all of those people had informally and formally trained me into becoming a trainer because I always was a trainer in terms of youth work. I was, I, you know, put on two-week school leaver workshops for Easter school mm -hmm. leavers, designed them and ran them, and you know, I had games and I had exercises to not just uh, <coughs> lecture, you know. So yeah. it really just suit my 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 background in terms of training. So and that was uh, so that's how I got down to London. Right. So then, how did Dan start? Well, shortly after the. Chesterfield, so remember, right, this is like, I think we're in 89, so this is when, uh, 89, 89, 89. Mm. so yeah, and now we, we you know, we, I've just been on TV, mm. Choice and Right, Strong Woman's on TV, the Moving On Festival was filmed, I was all over that, uh, and then the Chesterfield Access campaign came on, and that was like a whole story, every month it was like, we'll bring you an update next month, you know, so, so it was every, every month it fought all the way down. So when they saw me doing that radical stuff, this woman called Anna Thorpe, who worked in Ely, said, right, you know, my group of young people wants to do something about the telethon. And I never watched it. I mean, I, I really didn't watch because I knew it was a bad programme. I just mm. I wasn't offended by it because I never watched it. It was like, you know, what's, what else is on? So I said, well, you know, I'm not sure. I'll, let's, let, we'll do a bit of a call round, you know. So Ken Davis, when's it, when is it? You know, Mike Oliver, I'll be there, you know, Vic, can I speak? You know, everybody, it wasn't like, it was the easiest gig to organise. It wasn't about, they just wanted to know when, where and how many people can we bring. And that's how that happened and, you know, what happened after that. So we had a big telethon, uh, your daughter, 
Mm -hmm. That one broke into the studio. Mm -hmm. I, at the end of that demo, at the end of that day, I've, I've been there since 10 in the morning, setting up. And I just hit a wall, at, right at the end, when people started to march. And I said, I can't do this. I, I just feel like I've just got to sit down for a minute. I said, Mike, lead the march, Mike Higgins. And without realizing he was blind, he went, he went the wrong way. Mm. <laughs> he went away from the damn building. Everyone's following Mike. Like, <laughs> no, no, no. Get away, Mike. Get away, Mike. <laughs> then I went to the pub and found out what happened afterwards. Right, cause right. I, 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 I just got to the end of my mm. stress level. You know, stress mm. in a bad way, but just, you know, everyone, you know, people coming on and off the stage, blah, 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 blah. blah. Everything was going on. Police, da, 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 da. In, yeah. the, in your head all the time, it can only take so much. And I thought, well, this is the end. Mm -hmm. They're not going to miss me here. This is what I can do from here, you know. So, and anyway, and then we got in the pub after thinking this is good. Who were those guys? <laughs> we didn't know who. To, we never took any names. We didn't know who'd done what. Mm -hmm. So we had another. We, there was another one in two years' time, and that two years we said, no. If we do this again, we are going to get names because that's the way we're going to get a network. So the second telephone was the one where we really took more care. We took care about who was bringing people, like Jill Crawshaw was bringing 30 from Le Le Leeds. She better be one of our organisers. You know, we had people from Manchester bringing lots of people. We needed Manchester contact, you know, so it was like that. We had, in London you had different boroughs bringing people, so else it became, you know. Mm. Yeah, I mean, so by that time, and it, so it came, the second television happened, we knew it was almost in the water, then it was great. Now it was time to form Dan, and you know how quite often in these movements people can be very petty. Mm. So we needed somebody to chair the meeting. Uh, and we, we decided we'd bring all these organisers and CAT, because CAT was around, remember? It wasn't like... CAT was well... The Campaign for Accessible Transport in London was, mm. you know, doing good, but they weren't prepared to really export out of London. They said, no, we, we need to stay here, you know, this is fine, what we're doing. And I was talking with Tracy and uh, Kirsten, saying, look, yeah, that's good, but do you really mind if we do export it to Manchester and other places? Because I think in the end we're going to have to. And Keith Armstrong. So we decided that we were going to do it anyway, but we, it, was, it needed hand, handling with a bit of sensitivity. So I asked Ken Davis to, to chair it. So Ken actually was the chair of that meeting which decided how we were going to set Dan up. And we, then the, the last so yes, we were going to set Dan up, yes, we were going to have organisers, yes, we were going to do direct action, like CAT, you know, we, we, we were, this is for people who were going to push it to, to the end if you want, you needed to, yes, it would be non-violent, all those things were decided, then it was, well, what do we hit? And it was either benefits, it was going to be civil rights, or transport, those were the three mm -hmm. options that were there. We'd been to America then and talked to some people over there, and they said, well, benefits is just about a campaign for perpetual poverty, which it is. Uh, civil rights is far too broad, you'll never focus, you'll, you'll never do anything, you'll just do a bit of everything, you'll never win. And the, the buses is really good because it's so easy. And you, you, you're starting out, you stay on the buses or transport, because it's obvious what the issue is. Disabled person, handcuffed bus, get, guess why? Step, to, everyone gets it. So, um, so that's, in the end, we had, it, it was a narrow victory. It was 13 for... 13 for transport, 11 for benefits, uh, 2 for civil rights. I think people understood why not civil rights. Mm. Yeah, but it, obviously we weren't going to, there was a civil rights movement beginning at the time, mm. and that, we felt, well, we could always support that. We don't need to be the flagship, or we don't need to take, take over what BCRDP was doing, mm. you know, or even Radar was doing. We need to be just supporting where we need to be. So that's how Dan was formed. It was formed at the Disabled Drivers Association of Norwich. And that was the weekend we did it. So then we were all thinking about more. You know, we're going to hit first. And then the Christchurch by-election happened with Ron Hayward, who was a Tory MP with MS. Mm -hmm. And he was about to uh, repeal the... He, he talked out the, um, the, the current civil rights bill. Mm. He filibustered it. Yeah, because there were, were a number of attempts, weren't there? Yeah, but he was the one who actually tried to filibust. And just thought, disabled person doing that. And he was standing for... He got kicked out of Bristol. And he was now standing in Christchurch. What what year was that? Ninety two. Yeah, that would it? be ninety. That would be ninety three. Ninety three. Yeah, because I think Dan was. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was formed Dan, and then it was suddenly he just came out and we thought, okay, well, we're going to do three of the actions, but this is going to be a one day action in Christchurch. Get down on that before. Cause everyone, most of us, were. Hazel Simmons was involved with that. Yeah, the same. And we all got down there, 
it was a, one of the best actions as really, it really was because the first thing, we, the, the best thing what happened was we found out where the, the, the reporters down there gave us his schedule for the day at 7.30 in the morning. We turned up at the press conference at 7.30 in the morning. So the, they, they were, he'd handed out to his, sorry, he'd handed out to his reporters all the, all the, um, the press pack uh -huh. and then that's at 3.30 he's going to be here, he's always going to be doing that. So we knew exactly where he was and we could be ahead of him. So he starts off with the press conference and we're in there going, ah, 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 and he's all shouting, right? Then we come out and the films, they've all stopped filming the, him, they're all filming us now. And then he was going to see, <laughs> then he was going to see um, uh, one of his candidates, you know, what, um, one of his constituents, and this his house was like full of Voltor, you know, Voltor, Voltor. I mean, I said, <laughs> Chris Hughes, Brendan Hill, and John Smith, already there, sitting outside the house, saying like that, don't vote to all, right, not charity. <laughs> He's like, and then the worst, the scariest thing was they had, he had a big rally out in the sticks, and we had to all jump in the cars and get to it. Some of us got there, and this was like full, full, full of the hangman flag on the gate. And uh, they were there, yeah, bring back hanging for everyone, you know? And it was like, uh, and that was hard because there were six of us and we had to stand up and shout and scream and everyone was like looking at like we looked like a kill and we didn't know how many of them had guns and stuff like that so we did a bit there and then after that I think we, met, we went back to his office did that and then we marched up and down the high street of Christ Church and we, we had people on the side just going keep coming out of the shops clapping us and we did it we went three laps around the damn high street you know the picture in the paper next day was Anne Young from who's now in Norwich with Eddie Hardy the, the artist and Eddie's crying and Anne's got his arm around her Hayward makes disabled people cry I mean the guy lost by 40,000 he lost the 40,000 majority he, we turned 80,000 votes around so we knew we had some power and that's really our damn well, was that, that the first time I think that the um, design of the based on Star Trek that you had on T-shirts wasn't that when that first appeared? It was, yeah. Well, who, it? who designed that? And tell that, us a that bit came, about oh, that. Oh, that came from that came from Chicago. Right. It was an American thing. Uh, a woman called Anna Stoneham, who's uh, passed, sadly passed away. She came up with that, and we saw it on their T-shirts. And we kind of redesigned it a little bit because we thought we could do improve it a little bit. And but the actual slogan, yeah, to bold to go where everyone else has been before, came from that one. Then we put the dance mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Yeah, and that first came out in London. In the next, in the next action, which was, uh, was was it London? I think it was L L Leeds with Jimmy Savile. God bless mm -hmm. him. God bless him. I don't think. Yeah, and he was trying to build a rose garden at the bottom of Leeds train station. Even though you couldn't get on the train, at least you could go and smell the roses. So, well, you know, when he, he was going to come to open it, so we planted ourselves in the rose garden. Basically, <laughs> he was like very annoyed and very angry that he wasn't going to get the right publicity. We, we then caught some trains and. And the next day we caught some buses. Then had a fire alarm in the hotel at three in the morning. <laughs> and so, and then we went to Leeds, and we, that's how Dan went. And you know, um, in the end, we kind of got both of what we wanted in terms of transport. And we also, I think, it helped quite a lot to get the ADA, the, so the, the DDA, uh, the DDA passed. Because mm -hmm. in the end, it wasn't just like this. The, I think even today, I mean, you see today in 2015, disabled people blocking the roads. Because they really don't understand how else they can do it. So, in, in fact, it didn't really matter whether it was about transport. It could have been about the civil rights, but we still just caught buses because it was a symbol. It became a symbol of that that time that you know that's people are going to protest, you know, anchor themselves to something uh, <coughs> to, to to advance the the rights and stuff like that. How how do you think um, for those young people, the people who've not been political before, being part of Dan sort of change their way of thinking about disability issues. Do you mean the people? The new activists who got involved. In Dan? Hmm. Oh, right. Um, well, people people got involved. One thing we, we learnt from the people in America was there was a T-shirt over there which uh, Mike Oberg, who was leading the movement, designed. And it was adapt. It had the many shades of strange. And if you knew about that, you knew what that meant. In other words, there were some very strange people in Adapt, you know, and there still is, you know. And there were certainly some very, very strange people in Dan. But then what is strange, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's strange the new normal. So people never came to it like, uh, you know, like it would be like a trade union. Some people came through self-interest. You know, they wanted to get on the bus. Some people came through altruism. They wanted other people to get on the bus. So they, some people had, you know, re relatives who needed to get on the bus. Uh, and some people just saw it as a good political principle. So you had all those shades, and, and even then, on top of that, 
you had people who came for the party. And you had people who came because it gave them a purpose in life. A bigger, a bigger purpose in life than they already had. It gave the life some meaning. It gave them a... Well, because we did three-day actions and people always moaned about, why do we have to do three days? You know, you, we have to book the hotel in advance. You, you know, how do you know it's going to be right that time? And it, you know, it doesn't matter. Part of it was building up that, that community. So in the end, Dan wasn't just like a, an organisation. It was more, for most of us, a community. It was like you know, a family. It was like it was a big support network. You know, people would rush up to so-and-so and do a little bit like that if someone wasn't getting housing or if someone wasn't getting this so we'd be flying around the country and those little hit squads would be going to support our members basically usually but on an issue that was like wider than just them so mm -hmm. I, I, I really don't know I mean I think that's what that's what I think people found out of it and still in some ways miss mm -hmm. you know uh, uh, in, in, in today's that we don't really have that as, as much I don't think mm -hmm. I mean at the time that Dan was Growing Disabled People's Action Network, the was it Action Network or Direct Action Network? Direct Action Network, Disabled yeah. People's Direct Action Network. Right. Um, we already had the British Council of Disabled People, so how did those two relate to each other? I think very well, mm. I have to say, and I think you have to give credit to people like Jane Campbell for that, because yeah. Jane never felt that there was a threat to be so people, which there wasn't. It was just that we were like the, uh, you know, the, the hardcore wing, you know, mm. we, we never really disagreed on the fact that disabled people wanted full civil rights. And Jane never said, well, it has to be something else, you can't just do transport even though you decided it. So mm. that was never, that would have been where the big split would have been if they'd mm. start to say that. What we did get was a phone call from BCDP saying, the bill's coming to the house on Friday, can you do a quick action? So mm. that did happen. Mm. We even had Bert Massey. Asked begging us to come and do a, an action, so that was that was kind of fun. And he also said, you know, do you really have to have those rights not radar T-shirts? You know, Alan. I said, well, you know, I, I don't control that. We're a bunch of anarchists, so it was like, yeah. So it was like, yeah. It was, but he was actually asking for those T-shirts and the bodies in them to actually help with. But the, not the T-shirt. <laughs> he, he, he hadn't got control of that. No. So yeah, but that that's where any split would have started mm. to occur. But it never really did. And then after, I mean, I think it was. Glenda Jackson, who was Minister of London, mm -hmm. who was the first to take note of what had been said and, and brought forward the date when London buses would be made accessible. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, for the whole of the UK, it's, I think we're still two years off all new rolling stock being made accessible in yeah, yeah. 2017. Yeah. So it's, it, although it set the pace, it, it was quite a, a long time till those rights actually came in for everybody. Well, yeah, I mean, behind the scenes, we had mm. we had some very very clever people mm. who were like real boffins in, in mm. transport. The one I used most was uh, Tony Baldwinson, mm. who's uh, L Lorraine Gradwell's husband, mm. who knows about transport backwards mm. and forwards and every other way. So he explained to us, and it just confirmed by the folks in America. So what happens is, your big conurbations like London will be first, mm. Manchester will be right up there, you know. Mm. But they don't just get, the buses just don't go into the Thames, they go down the, the food chain. So that bus that was now, for floating around London in 2007 when they finally mm. got rid of it, might still be in the rural part mm. of Southampton, you know, the rural part of Hertfordshire mm. or somewhere, you know, or it might be up in Chapel on the Frith, because those are the last places to get, mm. and then after that it becomes a school bus. Mm. Right, so he, he explained to us that in 2000 and, you know, 1995, we went to Birmingham to the mm. motor show, to the bus show, bus and mm. coach show. Uh, and it wasn't an accessible bus there, so it was really was an uh, important thing to hit. Mm. In 1999, we went back and there was no inaccessible bus on the show. And that's when we knew we'd won. That's when you could mm. say, well, you call the major campaign off now because that's the national campaign done they're not going to be able to buy if they want to buy a bus with steps on it it's going to cost them more because they're not designing them anymore mm. so we realized that some part of it was at the design stage mm. it was at the you know manufacture stage because if you, you know if, you, if you're saying well can you put some steps in the bus the able body they're missing it you know yeah it'll cost you about another hundred thousand oh well forget it you know just leave it with the mm. ramp so mm. that's how we kind of in the end that was like the way you actually won it uh, but again it was still important to keep the pressure on uh, and still, people, I mean, people were still hitting buses years after, mm. you know, in their own communities. We never said stop hitting buses in, mm. you know, Chesterfield. 
keep going until you get them, you know, you get up the food chain. And do you think, I mean, that was, from my point of view, as part, part in Dan, but mainly an observer, that was your most successful period around the transport. Because after that, you moved on to the Free Our People campaign. Mm -hmm. Tell us how that connected, what was the connection between the two, and how did the Free Our People sort of take over? I think from the day one of Dan, we, there was enough of the founder members of Dan who recognised, well, first of all, if you go back to like becoming a disabled person, you know, mm -hmm. politically savvy, we talk about, you know, disability being, you know, you know, it, under the social model, it's society that disables us. Well, yes it does, uh, but I do think there is therefore a hierarchy of disability, and it's not necessarily to do with hierarchy of impairment. Mm -hmm. It's a hierarchy of severity of oppression, mm -hmm. and I can't think of anything, you know, higher than people lying in their own shit in the Leonard Cheshire home, pressing a bell, and the nurse doesn't come for 45 minutes. Mm. And when she comes, she gives you a drug to make you sleep so you're not going to be in any more trouble. Mm. That, I think, is... I don't think anyone would argue that that's uh, uh, more oppressive than somebody who has to wear glasses, mm. yeah, as Ian Statton says mm. once in a, in a song. So, yes, we, we can all have impairments. Yes, we can all have be disabled by society. But you, I think we, we wanted to reach... We, we knew that if we didn't, no one else would. You know, we could be campaigning for anything else in the whole disability spectrum, but, you know, who else would actually campaign for this? So we really felt it was important, even when we were doing transport, to start, you know, to think that, that we're doing that so that these people, when they get out, can actually go out in the community, where they mm, go. Mm, mm. I mean, so it was like, let's do the easy one first, this is, this is obvious, and then let's tattle. Now we've got the sophistication of campaigning, learning about how mm. buses operate, how the food chain, blah, blah, blah. Mm. All, now we've done all that learning, perhaps we start, you know, we've been, let's teach ourselves about how this system operates mm. and see how we can attack it. And so we, we began to do Free Our People, which is still going on today in the, both this country and in America. America's not been any more successful than them. You know, it, it, it's incremental rather than it all happens at once. What we've learned with this one is you don't get one big victory with one mm. big law and it's mm. all over. Mm. Uh, we got the Care and the Community Act in 94. That was a very, very big thing which America's still working for. Mm. You know, we got direct payments. We got mm. the Independent Living Fund. We got, a, you know, we have incremental victories and of course you get cuts. You know, the, mm. good, the good one comes in. But I don't think, I think what we have established is that disabled people want to live independently in the community. Mm. That the alternative is not something that's mm. desired by many people. And therefore, I do think it has been a little bit more successful than people see. Mm. Although, I do think it did, it was very much harder to run an organisation like Dan and focus it there. I mean, other people were doing it as well. And it wasn't just Dan that began to reduce in its size. BCODP mm. was having its problems. Mm. Uh, so our natural ally was, lose, we were losing that. Uh, and we, we continued with that, we were still hitting that right up to 2004, uh, when really we, I saw, my last action was 13 people on Westminster Bridge, 13 mm. out of what we used to be 200. Mm. And I thought, well, and, you know, it was going to be very hard for the people I'd worked with and tried to train to carry that on. And it was also a real, um, it was a real thing, it was, one of the things that used to drive me crazy was, People would say, why, don't we, why doesn't Dan do this? Mm. And I said, well, you know, well, it was always like the focus was back to the name. Mm. I said, no, 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 if you really want to do that, go away and organise it, and we'll, we'll support you, but mm. you go away and do all the work. We're not rent mob mm. you know. Mm. And also, if Dan is no more, it's okay, because maybe Dan has to stop existing so that something else can grow in its place. Mm. Mm. So I think it took a while for things like Deepak and, mm. you know, the Save the Independent Living Fund movement and the Not Dead Yet movement mm. to realise that Dan wasn't around anymore and mm. wasn't going to do all this stuff for them. Mm. And so maybe they had to start organising themselves in the way that they felt comfortable with uh, and I think that's okay I mean I've, I've got no you know Dan doesn't have to, you know, organizations don't have to stay and live for hundreds of years if they do mm. they're probably mm. doing mm. you end up start you start off by doing good and they end up doing not so good because you're kind of clinging on in, in Star Trek we call it the Klingons mm. yeah mm. yeah so we don't want people to just cling on to a name we want people to go out and organize again now do so. you do you think I mean it the Dan if you like, not only was a, a sort of fairly unique formation that came together, but that it was something to do with the times that we lived in that it came at that time. 
that there were people campaigning for disabled people's rights, but there'd been no parliamentary recognition of it as such, and therefore one could feel on the outside. And by 2004, you had Tony Blair's Prime Minister, he actually set up a government think tank to look at the rights of disabled people, and in fact they set a date that by 2025 there would be complete equality between disabled and non-disabled people. Mm -hmm. Of course, all that went when the new government came in, but do you think that also diffused the situation a bit? Yeah, I think, well, I think very similar to, to, to I keep going back to America because we did mm. learn a lot, of, there was a lot mm. of cross fertilization. Very similar to when Bill Clinton came in. Mm. Bill Clinton came in, there's like, you know, the disabled people's friend. Can you remember an act that he passed that was mm. actually helped disabled people mm. in his eight years? I can't. What I can remember is a lot of the leadership of the movement getting jobs with Bill Clinton. Mm. Yeah, Gene mm. Human was like, you know, mm. there, blah, blah, blah. They all suddenly became big advisors, but mm. actually nothing really came out of that. So it is a lesson to be learned that, you know, just because you get a job in the government mm. doesn't mean to say, you know, and your best friends, you know, doesn't necessarily, doesn't necessarily mean that's a good thing. It might, you know, because you, you you're taking the hunger out of the movement. Mm. You're taking, you know, you take the organisers out of the movement. There is no movement. Mm. You, know, you can take the leaders out any time. That doesn't matter because everyone wants to be a leader. But very few people want to organise, very few people have the guts to actually say, no, you know, we're going to organise and it doesn't really matter about my life anymore and what, I'm get, what money I'm getting and that money can go into the movement, oh God, we've just got to make it happen somehow. That, that takes guts. Mm. The leadership doesn't take guts. The leadership takes ego and organising mm. takes guts. So I'm not, I'm not even looking at leaders. I, I very rarely want to meet leaders. Hence my reluctance to go anywhere near the UN or the, mm. you know, those things that you got to mention. But mm. uh, that's my reluctance because I don't think the leaders, the organisers aren't there. Mm. The organisers are the ones who damn were conned into sending them to the damn thing in the first place. Mm. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I mean, I look for organisers mm. all the time, and it's to find out what an organiser is. That's those are me that the real the real heroes of the disabled people's movement. Right. Yeah. So where where do we get our new organisers from now? Well, I think they're out there. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I, don't, I don't see suddenly like some, somehow people don't like organising uh, have just disappeared from the planet of the earth. I think it's just looking for the, you've got to identify them, you know. You'll be, they'll be the people in the back, they'll be the people who've, you know, set the chairs up and worried about, you know, where the accessible loo is. They'll be the people who are on the phone a lot, you know, reminding you to come to the meeting or, you know, saying, you know, come, there be, might be people who shout at you on the phone for not coming or, mm. you know, make make you feel guilty. You know, they may be the people who, um, you know, um, uh, can, can, yeah, I mean, they're, they're the people. They're not necessarily the spokespeople. They're mm. not necessarily the people who put the TV cameras. And they're not necessarily the people who, you know, are, are like, you know, like me. You know, they're mm. the people who, who, who organise that. And I wasn't organised, I'm not saying I wasn't, but the, the, and that's why I didn't do as much in the singing, because if I spent, more, if it spent all that energy in organising on the singing, I'd probably be Bob Dylan by now, or mm, whatever. Mm. But then I'd also be advertising soap powder somewhere. But your songs really are rather different to, say, someone like Bob Dylan, because they come out of your lived experience. Yeah. So perhaps your songs are more important in many ways. Well, that, important to me, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but they're important to other people who can identify with them as well. Well, I wouldn't like to compare... I mean, people do compare that, and I, I don't know. I mean, I, I love Bob Dylan songs. Um, mm. But I I do like what I do. I mean, I don't, I don't not just sing folk, but I do think it's a folk tradition. I think mm. it is about a, a telling of stories, yeah. a representation of people who perhaps aren't... You know, you, I mean, in folk tradition, who'd know about what happened on the high seas and the, mm. and the sad sea shanties? Who would know what would happen in, in the cotton fields of Alabama if it wasn't for the blues? Mm. So it is, that, I mean, I think my, all my songs are blues, even mm. though they're clearly not. Mm. All of them are blues, because somebody, who, I can't remember now, who's one of the big blues guys that I really admired, B.B. King, he says, why is it that, somebody asked B.B. King once, he says, why is it that, when you listen to a blues song, which is like about my baby left me, or I lost my house, or I lost my home, or I've lost all my money gambling and drinking, why does that make people happy? Yeah, why is it such a like upbeat music? So, well, it, what you're saying is I've been there too. Mm. Yeah, so you're not the only one who's gone through all this crap. So I think that's why all my songs are about the blues because it's all about the crap you go through, and therefore I've gone through all I've, crap that's touched me that other people mm. have gone through. And so that's why it makes people feel good mm. rather than feel bad. 
Looking now in a broader lens, just say to finish this up, what would you say, looking back on the experience, really, 25 years, if you like, of being an activist, organising amongst disabled people, what do you think are the key lessons that you've learned from that and what would be the things you'd want to pass on to future generations? This is a story I learned from a guy called Wade Blank in America who founded ADAPT.